Hey everybody, it's V Spear, the Director of Impact for the James Beard Foundation. Excited to be here with you again for a webinar on HR and employee management. We've gotten a ton of questions on how to navigate things like PPP, re-engaging folks um, who are out on unemployment right now, what it's gonna be like to start up, and I'm so excited that we have Sarah Deal here today who is going to answer pretty much all of those questions. Um, <laughs> As always, we want this to be really interactive. Um, so Emily is gonna review with you a little bit right now how you can interact with us throughout the program. Yeah, thank you and welcome back everybody. Um, as always, this webinar will be recorded. We're gonna send it out to you after the program wraps, likely sometime tomorrow. Uh, you can also catch up on any of our other webinar recordings a great one that we did yesterday on uh, a path to reopening at jamesbeard.org slash industry dash support dash webinars and we'll send that link out to you as well um, we're going to save all the questions for the end but if you have them as they come up just send them through using the question function uh, on the go to webinar control panel and we'll make sure that uh, we get them to V and Sarah if you're having any technical difficulties, please shoot us a note, either using the question function or the chat function. It helps us understand if there's like a big tech problem, if the sound goes out completely. So definitely please let us know and we will help you troubleshoot that. Thanks. Great, thanks Emily. Um, and as Emily said, we are doing all that we can to try and support the industry from a, a various angles. Um, you can go to jamesbeard.org slash relief, and that's where we have all the information that we've been able to compile from across the nation, including our own efforts to either put money back in the pockets of restaurants who are trying to reopen and pay some outstanding bills. Um, all of the webinars are hosted there. We have links to relief kitchens, things that are happening nationally where folks can get additional support. We also have something very important over there, which is the Chef Action Toolkit. So what's gonna happen with that is if you are wondering, how do I reach out to my representative? How do I talk to um, my governor? Or I see something I really like going on in Maryland. How do I get more information about that to apply to my own home state? You're gonna wanna look for the Chef Action Toolkit. A lot of work has been put into that, and it's something we're really proud of that definitely helps take the fog out of how you get in touch with the right people to move action forward in your state. So Sarah's gonna take over controls now and start um, by uh, sharing with us a little bit about what who she is, where she comes from, what kind of work she's been doing, and um, how we can navigate you know, taking care of our most precious resource, which is of course our people. So Sarah, tell me a little bit about yourself. Sure. So first of all, thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. One of the most important things to me is sharing information with our community at this time. So it's great to have a platform like this um, to share. So I'll start by talking a little bit about uh, me and about my company, Empowered Hospitality. So Empowered Hospitality grew out of my experience in restaurant operations. I actually started with Hillstone Restaurant Group right out of college, worked as a manager for about four and a half years before going into training in HR. And my experience had always been that we needed HR support and didn't always have the resources or the education that would really help those ideas resonate from an operations perspective. So that is our philosophy at Empowered. Um, our mission is creating workplaces where people thrive and we offer HR coverage focused in the hospitality industry, specifically for small businesses. So most of our clients have uh, between 50 and 200 employees. And we've worked with over 70 clients and over 10,000 employees in the last three years. Yeah, it's such an important thing. And it's often the first thing that restaurants, you know, get to last is how do we create an HR culture or is this something I can afford? And so it's so great to see what you've been able to do with these clients over the last few years. Thank you. So one of the first things I wanted to start by talking about is actually what is HR? Because I think HR is a fairly undefined area. It intersects with operations in a lot of ways. And so for a small operator, the question is often not, do I need an HR person, but also what does an HR person do? Mm -hmm. So uh, we've broken it down to five pretty simple categories. The first being attract. So 
crafting an employer value proposition, which is basically what value do you offer to employees who work at your company. Um, retaining, so cultivating a clear sense of purpose, a mission, a set of core values, an inclusive culture, a competitive total rewards program to stay relevant. Um, and as we all know, the battle for talent has been pretty fierce over the past couple of years. It will be interesting to see how it changes in light of this crisis, um, but undoubtedly these things will still be really important. Um, next is support. So a lot of what we know as HR is this piece. It's HR tools and SOPs, administration, mm -hmm. payroll, um, all of the day-to-day -day parts and nuts and bolts that you see within your team. Um, enable, so harnessing technology as much as possible to automate these processes and enable your team to focus on what matters. And this could be optimizing your payroll platform. It could be finding a tool to manage your applicant tracking pool, um, really leaning on technology as a resource, which I think we could do more of. Uh, and last is empowering, which is all about cultivating ownership and autonomy within your leaders. Yeah, absolutely. And I've got just a whole list of questions for you here that already came in that, that focus on exactly that thing. How do we attract, retrain, and support our employees, especially in this time? Awesome. Yeah, I'm excited. So first, thinking about how to navigate the post-pandemic world, and not just from an HR perspective, but really from a more broad business perspective, means preparing for the unpredictable. Mm -hmm. We don't know exactly what the coming months will look like, but we can prepare for different scenarios and undoubtedly will experience the three scenarios that are shown here, expansion, stability, and contraction, and we will probably experience them over and over. Yeah. Um, and this uncertainty will likely extend until there's a universal, universal access to a vaccine. And the timeframes uh, vary in terms of experts' uh, estimation anywhere from a year to two years. Mm -hmm. So in terms of these three phases, in the expansion phase, which a lot of us are preparing for right now, think about revenue increases, headcount increases, increased activity and interaction between people, mm -hmm. health and safety concerns increase as a result of that, and increased anxiety as your yeah. team starts traveling again, as more clientele are coming in and they're interacting with your staff. Then we go into the stability uh, phase where revenue and headcount are both static. This could be dictated by a couple of things. It could be a return to quote unquote normal, but more likely it would be dictated by a government restriction. Like in New York City, we had a capacity cap at 50% for the weeks prior to the shutdown. So something like that. Contagion gradually increases because there is still interaction happening and health and safety controls need to be in place to limit contagion. And then contraction. So in the contraction phase, which we just went through, revenue and headcount decrease, potentially layoff and furloughs might be in place. Increased anxiety, which I think we see as a theme here that whenever there's change, there's anxiety. And then a need for alternate revenue streams. And I think this is where we see a lot of businesses getting really creative and inspired, which is something that's been really cool to watch over the past couple of weeks. Yeah, and that's something that we're hearing you know, from all the speakers so far, Elizabeth, even yesterday, talking about the fact that the, there won't be a silver bullet in which everything goes back to something you can anchor yourself in. It's going to continue to be a bit of an ebb and flow. And, and the products that you're creating today that maybe weren't a part of your original dream and opening your restaurant will become assets to you in this second wave of this contraction phase. So keeping all that Absolutely. consistency yeah, front of mind as we go through this. And to the degree that you can involve your team in those ideas, this is something we'll talk about later, the more the merrier when it comes to inspiration. And I think pooling your resources and really drawing ideas from every level within your company is going to become even more important. Yeah. So in terms of HR, there is no one size fits all solution. 
Your approach should balance your strategic goals, your financial outlook, and empathy for your team. So in terms of strategic goals, we're thinking about employee retention, PR and reputation, expansion and new openings, and changes to products or services. There's, I'm sure, a lot more that we could put on that list as well. Um, financial outlook, we'll talk a little bit about some of the financial programs that are out there during this presentation, but cash reserves, access to capital, mm -hmm. anticipated demand, additional revenue streams. Um, just to pause on this topic, really cool ideas I'm seeing all over the country, meal kits, delivery and takeout, to-go cocktails, holiday promotions, even selling experiences like wine and cheese tastings, um, online mixology classes. So there's a lot to be done in that category. And then just overall business health. Um, mm -hmm. It's the one statement no one really wants to think about, but if there's ever a time to gracefully bow out of a business that's not functioning well, um, or that hasn't been making money for a long time, this is the time to do it. Yeah, excellent point, Sarah. And um, I didn't do it at the beginning, so we're gonna jump in now with it. We wanna remind everyone, this is a peer-to-peer -peer friendly conversation with our friend Sarah. What works in other states may not work in your state. So while this is not the be all end all law of the land, we hope that you hear some things here today that work for you, but you do investigate what's legal in your state and what's gonna be best for your business. And disclaimer over. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, and then third is thinking about empathy for your team. And I know a lot of questions came in on this topic already, thinking about financially vulnerable team members, which make up such a huge part of our workforce and what you can do for them, undocumented workers, mm -hmm. um, health concerns that your employees might have. We're not just navigating this as individuals, but we're thinking about how our health concerns work within the workplaces that we're part of, um, child and elder care needs. So commitments that team members might have to caring for a family member availability of public resources, which I think um, goes hand in hand with the question of documentation and whether a worker who is undocumented can participate in those programs or not. And emotional trauma, um, put bluntly, we have all gone through trauma over the past month, whether it was shutting down a business, losing a job, losing a family member. So we need to keep in mind that how our team acts in this situation is going to be unusual. It's going to be abnormal. They're not going to be acting the way we expect them to, and that's okay. Yeah, that's an excellent point, folks. You know, their emotions are gonna manifest in different ways, and it's not personal to you as the business owner or to the, as the colleague. It's just different people handle grief differently, and this is a, a form of grief. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm going to spend some time talking through the primary options in terms of staffing decisions. This is a pretty dense slide, so I'm going to do my best to break it down piece by piece. So basically, there are four primary tactics that you can employ, maintaining full staff and so making no changes, reduction in pay, temporary layoff, and furlough, which I'll talk about briefly, permanent layoff. And each of these options prioritize employee welfare and company resources differently. They also can be used in combination, but carefully, keeping in mind that you don't want to treat employees within the same category differently. So the different areas that we broke down were employee impact, so the overall impact on your employee of this strategy, their eligibility for unemployment, Health benefits continuation, so whether a furloughed employee, for example, can keep their benefits, whether their seniority will maintain, and this usually uh, pertains to benefits. Perhaps you have benefits that get more robust over time. Uh, perhaps you have a PTO program that gives them more time off as the years go by. So seniority refers to that. Um, eligibility for leave under the Family First Coronavirus Response Act, which is the FFCRA. And then from a company perspective, cost, if there's capital potentially required, 
um, whether that decision would make the company subject to the WARN Act, which is a mandate that requires notification is sent to employees and to government officials if your business is over 50 employees, uh, has over 50 employees being laid off federally. And then there are also some state specific WARN Acts like in New York, it's anyone who lays off over 25 employees. And then whether there's documentation or payroll processes required and compliance concerns. So I'm gonna go through the three um, scenarios that people had the most questions about. That is reduction in pay, temporary layoff and furlough and permanent layoff. So a reduction in pay is essentially just a uh, partial financial disruption to the employee with benefit continuation. So nothing changes other than the person's compensation being reduced. They may be eligible for unemployment. So this is another question that came in quite a bit. Can people who are still employed claim unemployment? Yes, if the reduction takes them below the unemployment threshold in your state. So you'll wanna take a look at that. Uh, in terms of compliance concerns, reduction in pay is pretty much like continued employment in every other respect from benefits, pay time off, leaves of absence, et cetera. You wanna be mindful that if the reduction takes an employee below the exemption threshold, so in New York, it's 58,500, um, federally and state specifically, it is otherwise. If they go below that threshold, they're no longer eligible to be exempt from overtime. And so what that means is you can do that. You would have to transition them to an hourly a non-exempt basis. So what that means is essentially they're eligible for overtime at that point. There's also a notice requirement. In some states, it's legally mandated. In others, it is simply a best practice. You should give at least seven days notice if you're going to reduce someone's pay. Um, it is legally required in some states. So again, check your state-specific laws. Um, and for exempt employees, so salaried employees, the change has to occur in full week increments. So you can't change someone in the middle of the week, you have to change them for a full week pay cycle. Finally, there are requirements, as we know, that an employee who has a tip credit taken has to make enough, enough tips to, on a weekly basis, receive the minimum wage. Just be aware that if someone has um, dropped their uh, amount of sales, which we're all experiencing, that may impact your tipped team members and you might have to pay them more on a hourly basis. Second, temporary layoff and furlough. These terms are interchangeable from a legal perspective. So we've there's a lot of confusion around this. Furlough is a term that originated in the world of unions, and typically it's used in specific circumstances in specific industries. Right now, from a HR perspective, these two things are exactly the same. And basically what it means is it's a complete financial disruption, so it's a, it's a reduction to zero in terms of their compensation, but continuation of benefits and continuation of employment in a way because you're committing to bring that person back within a specified time frame. So that person is eligible for unemployment because their wages will drop down to zero. They are eligible to stay on health benefits. They also are eligible to maintain their seniority. So when they come back, they'll have the same PTO balance that they left with. However, they're not actively employed, so they can't use leaves of absence. They can't use PTO until they return. Mm -hmm. the, the main concern here from a compliance perspective is disparate treatment. What does this mean? Disparate treatment is basically treating people in the same employment category differently. And that in itself may not be a problem, but the fact that it opens you up to claims of discrimination can be very dangerous from a legal perspective. So when you're picking and choosing, generally the best practices, all servers should be treated the same, or 
you should at least treat people on the basis of their tenure with the company or something very objective. I'll talk about that a little bit later, um, but that would be the best idea to avoid any type of discrimination issues as a result of this. Um, and then permanent layoff, permanent loss of employment. So the difference between a temporary and permanent layoff is permanent layoff is a complete separation. There's no guarantee of reemployment. Um, and your company should have a policy. This may be your opportunity to establish that, that dictates how long an employee can be laid off in order to receive preferential treatment when being hired back. Again, this is not a legal thing. This is more of a policy to guide your company in being consistent. Mm -hmm. So if your policy is our 90 day time frame is allowed, and if an employee is hired back within those 90 days, their seniority will be restored, their benefits will be restored. That's a scenario that would play out in terms of this policy. Mm. Again, in terms of compliance, the main considerations are, again, disparate treatment and the WARN Act, which I talked about briefly. Uh, again, the WARN Act just requires that you provide certain types of notification to employees and to the government. It's basically a way of reporting that you've gone through a mass layoff. Yeah, that is incredibly detailed, <laughs> disturbing information, <laughs> but I feel better now knowing it. You know, I mean, it's this is all such an incredibly hard conversation, and I'm so grateful that you put this together for us to show exactly what folks' options are and what that means. Um, and I think especially the, the part about how to work around the treatment issues is going to come into play with a lot of folks too because there there is going to be hurt feelings no matter you know how necessary it is and any tools we have to navigate the emotions of this with empathy i i personally very much appreciate and i can see in the comments other people very much appreciate too yeah wonderful so the big question is all these federal stimulus offerings what to make of them as a small business and going back to the different um, scenarios. Maintaining your full team is an option. It is what, in theory, the payroll protection program was intended to encourage. Um, I will lead off by saying the PPP is really best navigated by you and your accountant. It's much more of a finance and strategy question than it is an HR question, but when it comes to HR, we're here to help you hire back your team and figure out how that communication works. So there are four primary sources of funding to consider. I'm gonna to touch really briefly on each of them. The Payroll Protection Program, which allows businesses to borrow money for a variety of qualified costs. Those costs include employee compensation, up to $100,000 a year, payroll costs, so cost of payroll processing and continuation of healthcare benefits and mortgage interest, rent, utilities, and interest on debt. The PPP offers full loan forgiveness on, on these qualified costs over a determined eight week period. As of right now, the eight week period begins when you receive the funds in your account. This has proven problematic for hospitality folks as I'm sure a lot of you know, because we don't have need for staff at this moment. So for us to reemploy people now for the coming eight weeks really doesn't make much sense from a business perspective. And if there's a chance that the loan might not be forgiven, that could be extremely harmful uh, to our businesses in the long run. In terms of the PPP, up to 25% may be used on non-payroll related costs. Some other options just to touch on really briefly, employment tax credits. So under the CARES Act, these credits allow businesses to receive uh, an employment tax credit for each quarter, equivalent to 50% of the wages of each employee, not exceeding $10,000 per employee per quarter. Mm -hmm. There is also an employment tax deferral program, which allows businesses to defer certain employment taxes, social security specifically, through December 31st, 2020. These taxes will then be due 50% at the end of 2021 and 50% at the end of 2022. Finally, there's a fourth 
program that's also under the Small Business Association called the EIDL, the Economic Injury Disaster Loan. This allows businesses impacted to receive low interest loans through the SBA and provides advances of up to $10,000. So really simply put, there are a lot of questions still surrounding, especially the PPP. Yeah. Um, which banks should I apply through? How long will the underwriting process take? Um, should I apply through multiple banks was a question I heard this morning. When exactly will the eight week forgiveness time frame begin? Will businesses be permitted to lay off staff again after the eight weeks expire? I understand that to be allowed. Whether or not that makes sense under the spirit of the program, I would, I'm not sure. And then what records will be required to obtain forgiveness? So there are a lot of questions here. As of this Tuesday, the Senate approved an additional $310 billion in funding to the PPP with $60 billion earmarked for small financial institutions and small businesses. Just today, um, it was mandated that publicly traded companies who receive PPP loans have to return them. Oh, wow. So this has been quite an interesting week. Um, if you are struggling with these options, please talk to your accountant. What you do not want to do, and this is the only guidance I'm going to give, do not use the money if there is not a legitimate need within your business until you are absolutely positive that it will be forgiven. Um, and I think there's this lack of certainty is really concerning as it relates to forgiveness because um, I would say it's unclear how exactly forgiveness will work. Yeah, good point, Sarah. And so folks listening at home know we've done three seminars on PPP. We will be doing another one with the changes. The, and the reason for that is the government says something and then the regulations say something else. So we have to keep updating it. It's not that necessarily the federal mandate is changing so much as the way that they're applying regulations is changing. So you need both a lawyer and an accountant and an HR person to essentially navigate them. We understand that nobody has that out there really truly. Most of our most of the small independent restaurants don't have that. So that's why we're bringing you these experts. Some things that I can answer from the questions and from previous PPP um, sessions that we had is that you, you do not have to rehire the same staff. It goes by headcount, not social security number of the employees. So if you had 10, you need to hire 10, essentially. Mm -hmm. Your forgiveness amount is going to be based on you using it for payroll. Your eight weeks starts when you get the money and there's not flexibility on that as of right now. Now the regs could change again. Um, if you want to let someone go now, you. You don't have to hire them again. So we have a specific question in here about if you have an employee that you need to terminate anyway, do they have to be brought back if you got a PPP? And the answer is no, it doesn't matter. You can hire a completely new staff if you want. Mm -hmm. um, and then Sarah, we just had a clarifying question on laying off some of your employees. How do you select um, to potentially avoid this disparaging treatment thing? Like, do you just go with the newest people first? Do you go with, how do you decide? Yeah. So actually, it's a great question. I'll talk about that in a little bit when I talk about rehiring, because the same methodology that you use to rehire is the methodology you should use to decide who to lay off. Um, it's a great question. All right, cool. So we'll get to that in a sec to sort of wrap up the PPP thing. Um, you want, again, there is so much still happening with it so quickly that you want to just employ your best judgment and ethics here. If you got it and you know it says use it 75% and 25% for rent, 75% for employees, really try to stick to that just for your own peace of mind and your own self. Because if you go out and you use it and you say, okay, well, it won't get forgiven, but it's only 1% money, we don't know if it'll stay that way. We see how it's changing now. So you don't want to sort of like try to rob Peter to pay Paul to use my grandma's reference, like, yeah. and then end up you know, really, really stuck in the end. So you want to try and play it as close to the law as you can and definitely check with your lawyers, accountants, and your state representatives on that. And one well, thing I can add, although I'm yeah. not an accountant, is um, what I'm seeing happen within the industry and community that, that we have. Um, I can't think of one business that is currently planning to use the money to bring back their full headcount immediately. 
Um, and that's not to say that's the right or wrong thing to do. But what I'm seeing more so is businesses holding on to their funds until they get clarification, which I think is smart. Yeah. Um, you know, or planning to get partial forgiveness and using it for the wages of people who they actually need to have on payroll right now. Great. Yeah, great clarification. Great. So next, we talked a bit about business strategy and financials, and I want to spend some time talking about uh, employee, employee welfare. Um, so Caring for employees during this time means a mix of offering empathy, heightened communication, and resources. And the important clarification here is this is regardless of their employment status with you at the time. The fact is most of our industry's employees are unemployed at the moment. And as an employer, the best thing you can do to gain loyalty and distinguish yourself is to care for those employees who are laid off, as well as those employees who are still employed with you. So I wanted to approach this from an employee's perspective. What are some of the things that they might ask of you as an employer during this time? So the first is help me feel connected. I think we're all at home seeing each other virtually, feeling a bit lonely, feeling a bit isolated. So providing regular updates, even if you don't have all the answers, is really important. I would recommend at least once a week. Um, mm -hmm. Offer family meal for employees and families. Be careful about this. If it's involving travel, if it's asking employees to get on the subway to come to the restaurant, probably mm -hmm. not a great idea. But if you can offer food or supplies, especially to employees who are experiencing financial hardship, that can be extremely meaningful. And if you can't, there are a lot of um, government or nonprofit organizations that are doing so as well. And finally, host a virtual happy hour. Um, I spent an hour with my team last Thursday using this awesome uh, filter that made all of us have crazy colored hair and weird hats and we amused ourselves and laughed and it was a great way to stay connected. Uh, welcome my feedback. So hosting brainstorming sessions to crowdsource inspiration. I mentioned earlier, I think the solutions that take us into the future may not come from owners, managers, it might come from line level employees who have a great idea. Take employee input seriously. This is really important, and I think there have been some great examples of this that I've seen operators who have made choices based on the feedback from their team, a choice to close, a choice to stop offering walk-in pickup for food, um, a choice to do contactless delivery. I think what we feel as individuals in, in a lot of cases is a much better dictator of what we should do as business operators. So following the instinct of your team rather than what the government tells you to do, um, I think will really put you ahead of the curve. And then not just ensuring that employees know your door is open, but actively checking in with them. I think we all know that some employees are more vocal than others. And during this time, people are going to express their concerns very differently. Some might keep it inside and not say anything. And so it's important to actually actively reach out and check and see how your employees are feeling, if you can change anything you're doing to support them, what their concerns are. Um, that dialogue is really critical. So next is be understanding. A lot of people ask questions about what should I do if an employee declines to come back to work. So just to talk about that really briefly, there are a lot of reasons right now that employees might not want to return to the workplace. The one most obvious being that they are likely making more on unemployment than they were making working in your business. Um, mm -hmm. There are other factors as well, though. There are family challenges. There's um, emotional, mental wellness issues. There are a lot of things that you might not be able to see that could impact an employee's decision. So my suggestion is be gracious. Understand and expect that people will not want to come back to work, and that is okay. There are mm -hmm. a lot of people out there who would be thrilled to have a job. And so part of our role as 
leaders is be adaptable and be prepared for the fact that you know if you can be understanding you will in the end form a stronger relationship with that employee mm -hmm. um, respect scheduling challenges due to personal obligations this is real people have a lot more going on at home now than they ever did before they will be late they might miss a shift be prepared to be flexible and in a sense i think we're very fortunate that people will feel um committed enough to the company to continue coming to work regardless of all of the factors driving them away and then also don't get offended if employees act out of character so i said this earlier but we all have gone through a very traumatic experience over the past month i'm sure a lot of you on this call have had many days where you did not want to go to work many days where you said i don't want to do this anymore many days where you didn't get out of bed. Um, and I think that understanding your employees are experiencing that as well will help you be a, a little more empathetic when it comes to uh, reactions that are out of character. Yeah, Sarah, it's been really hard to not have a walk-in to go cry in. I know a lot of the owners and staff feel like, if I could just go cry in the walk-in for five minutes, I could solve all of this. And that's a tough one. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> So next is make me feel safe. This is gonna be really important. Proactively share your safety protocols. So one of the first steps I'm gonna talk about in terms of preparing for reopening is put together a very detailed safety and health plan to protect your workplace. And share it proactively with your team. So before they come back, they should know what you have planned to protect them. Um, potentially weigh the pros and cons of taking employee temperatures. I'm happy to go more in detail into this uh, in the Q&A, but this is something that's becoming a more common practice, and I'm, I'm almost seeing it become a universal practice at this point. So um, consider, A, whether or not you want to do that. B, let your employees know. C, have a plan to do so consistently, um, and that's really important. Provide your team with links to mental wellness resources. There are multiple public resources out there for people who are feeling depression, anxiety. Make sure that your employees have access to those resources. And consider expanding your health benefits programs. So one of the things um, my teammate was sharing with me earlier is flu shots. Consider potentially providing free flu shots for your team. Even something small like that, when we get into flu season and coronavirus is still present, that could make a really big difference in terms of your employees health and how your business can operate. Hmm. And then finally, help me find resources. So I am feeling incredibly overwhelmed by the amount of information that's out there and undoubtedly all of your employees are feeling that way as well. So what you can do is create a guide to public resources that are available for hospitality employees. And at the bottom of the slide, I've actually included a list of benefits that are available for unemployed individuals, for employees, and for everyone. So that could be a start. Um, we also have a much more thorough list on our webpage, um, empoweredhospitality.com slash COVID-19. Mm -hmm. uh, so not just creating this guide but being ready to guide employees through what's available to them guide them through the unemployment process um, i have a good one pager that can provide a resource for them if any of you are interested feel free to email me after this presentation um, guide them through the health insurance marketplace there are some really fantastic um, benefits out there for employees uh, within the health marketplace they're offering special open enrollment periods. They're offering subsidies for employees who are experiencing financial hardship. So that is absolutely something all of your employees should have. Uh, and then consider starting a relief fund. So again, there were some questions about this. The best thing to know is make sure that the funds are distributed to your employees. Very important. Make sure that they're distributed fairly is the other thing. You, again, may know the personal circumstances of certain employees. You may think this employee deserves it more than this employee or this employee needs it more. 
um, try to avoid those individual judgments because in reality you don't know and that can be at risk of discrimination. Okay, so finally, I wanted to walk through a bit of a reopening checklist uh, in more detail. And I think the key here is know that during your reopening, a lot of your processes and your decision making process is, is oriented around people. Um, it's a bit cheesy, but people are the secret ingredient in our industry, truly. Um, mm -hmm. So, one, communicate early and often, even if you don't have all the answers at minimum once weekly, as I mentioned. Prepare a COVID-19 policy to guide your team through first-time situations. So like any other training that you've done in the past, whether it's sexual harassment prevention, whether it's health and safety or a Department of Health training, this requires education. Um, this requires a clear plan for how in your operation you're going to deal with coronavirus. So this policy should include hygiene standards. It should include what an employee should do if they're experiencing symptoms. It should also include what to do if a guest is experiencing symptoms and also what leave benefits are available to employees. Partner with HR to make objective compliant rehiring decisions. So in terms of layoff decisions, they follow very similar um, parameters. Some of the primary areas that you would want to consider are tenure, number one, how long an employee has worked with your company is probably the most objective way to decide who to rehire. The second is job role. So what role do you need to rehire? Do you need to rehire a delivery person, a line cook, a cashier, a server? Um, some roles might be necessary in the beginning and others might not be. Skill set. So operational needs might require you to rehire people with specific skills. For example, you might need to rehire people who are cross-trained in multiple positions. Um, obviously, from a labor cost uh, and operational perspective, that could really help. When you're choosing employees based on skill set, the best way to protect yourself is to make sure that the skill set is something that's clearly objectively documented. So it could be, again, resume, it could be a job description, it could be the fact that you have a payroll register with that person within multiple different positions. Um, documented performance record is another area that, again, can be a little subjective. So a lot of people might look at layoffs as an opportunity to not rehire people who they don't want to work with. Um, with a word of caution, be careful that if you're making decisions based on performance, it's based on objective information. And objective means if I walked into your restaurant and I opened that person's file, I would be able to clearly see why you're not rehiring them. Mm -hmm. So they have write-ups, they have notes, they have, you know, whatever information that kind of substantiates that decision. Uh, and then compensation is another thing to consider. So if you have someone who's highly compensated who might not be willing to take a pay cut, you know, you might not be able to hire them initially. Um, and then last is desire. So one of the things I would recommend is actually reach out to your team proactively and ask them to communicate if they're not interested in coming back and ideally do that in writing. That's great input, Sarah, and it answers a lot of the questions that we had here as it relates to like how you decide who to lay off. It's the same as how you decide who to rehire. It does not have to be the same people, but it has to have a reason. Like if you had somebody on your team, there should be reasons why they're not being asked back or why they don't qualify anymore for a number of reasons and just documenting that being tight on that. Um, and then considering cross training and whatnot. And also can, with the compensation piece, if you're gonna be giving somebody a job that they're gonna be doing multiple things, and we all know that our businesses have changed so much from what they originally were you know, thought to be, um, that you do, you know, we all know we get what you pay for. So if somebody can make $15 an hour on unemployment until the end of July, as it stands right now, 
you know, bringing them back, what are those benefits that you're offering that make it worth coming in? Um, is it a better work environment? Is it additional training? Is it the opportunity to move into a better position or, or have more responsibility? All those things are going to play into it. Um, but I, I think what we've seen, and Sarah, we were talking before, paying somebody, you know, somebody who's making $7 an hour isn't going to be able to afford to do that. And so we may be seeing a switch in what the cost of labor is and what the cost of the menu items are as it relates to that. Right. Yeah. And on that note of what you're offering employees, think about in that communication where you first reach out, inviting them back, what can you communicate that might set them at ease? So include what kind of safety standards you're going to have in place, for example. Um, include the fact that you might take their temperature. Include mm -hmm. the fact that they could still be eligible for partial unemployment benefits. I think that's very important. And then finally, and this is key for those of you who are concerned about employees coming back when unemployment is so generous, um, make sure that they know that if they decline presently, they might not have an opportunity to come back in the future. And that is not meant to be forceful or bully anyone. That's meant to be transparent because yeah. someone might make a decision that seems right in the moment and then realize months later that it was a mistake. Um, and as of this moment, increased unemployment benefits only last through July 31st. So in terms of um, final reopening steps, provide your employees with notice and information so they can prepare emotionally and logistically as I just said, um, request updated availability as well. So make sure that you have an updated schedule on hand so you know when they're available to work. Create your health and safety regimen. So be prepared. Coronavirus likely will occur in your workplace. There are fantastic resources out there. Um, one of our partners is a company called Bulletproof Safety. Um, and they provide a lot of information around health and safety to employees. Um, we'll actually be doing a webinar together a little bit later this month, but that's really important. Make sure that you have a plan. You know how often you're gonna be cleaning. You know what cleaning supplies you'll be using. You know if employees will be wearing masks at work based on only government mandate, or if you're going to require it all the time, even if the government does not. So really thinking through all those safety concerns is really key. And then finally, like I mentioned already, bring team members into the solution by actively soliciting and welcoming their ideas. So uh, in conclusion, um, I just wanted to say again, thank you so much. This is an awesome opportunity to share information. Um, one of the things I'm most passionate about making sure that people like me when I was in restaurant management uh, have the information that I did not have. Mm -hmm. uh, we're currently offering 30 minute complimentary phone calls to restaurant operators mm -hmm. in need of HR support. And you can sign up by emailing info at empoweredhospitality.com. Um, we also have a COVID page on our website, which I mentioned before, and we publish very frequent updates on our LinkedIn page. Um, and finally, I just want to thank and appreciate all of the other organizations that have been so generous and instrumental in supporting everyone during this time. Um, it has not been easy for any of us, myself included, and the leaders of these organizations and um, all of the resources they provide have just been incredibly helpful. So I've included some at the bottom here. Um, hospitality Executives Leadership Panel, Restaurant Workers Community Foundation, of course, James Beard Foundation, <laughs> One Fair Wage, World Central Kitchen, U.S. Bartenders Guild. There are many, many more. Um, but if you have questions or you're looking for resources, all of these organizations have really robust coronavirus resource, resource pages. Um, so feel free to take a look. Yeah, great. Thank you so much, Sarah. And thank you for putting so much effort into this presentation, which will be going out to the folks who attended today. So you'll have all of our slides for everyone who was furiously trying to write everything down. You'll be able to see this. This is available on her website as well. 
and thank you for offering those 30 minute personal coaching sessions. I think that's going to make such a huge difference to folks to just even be able to like talk to somebody, like have that human connection. Um, we have about five minutes for questions and you answered most of them <laughs> throughout the presentation. So thank you for taking a look at that ahead of time. Uh, burning question, what filter did you use for that staff party thing you did the other day? I think I gained a reputation as the person who had a different filter on every time I spoke. So I, uh, I used probably 25 of them. What was the name of the program you guys were on? Was it like house party or Zoom? Like what no, platform were you using? Oh, we were using Google Hangout. Google um, Hangout. Yep, yeah, yeah. But the the program is a plugin. Um, it's called Snap Camera, I believe. Okay. I can share it with you if you're interested because it was a good time. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so Snap Camera, Google Hangout was what you were using. Um, there's a question about on the Department of Labor website, a furloughed employee that refuses to return to work when given the chance is not eligible for continued unemployment. Is that something that the employer would report or what? how does that work? Yeah, this is a really great question because I think it's a moral conundrum that a lot of people will be coming up on as we start reopening. My question in response to that question is what kind of employer do you want to be? Um, and I think that, so A, technically, Yes, an employee who's offered a position is no longer eligible for unemployment. So you would have the option to report them, revoke their unemployment privileges. I think the real question is what happens to your reputation if you do that? And is it worth it? Because that employment employee is not coming back to work regardless. You know, given the sensitivity of this time, I can't imagine someone deciding to not come back and then changing their mind potentially. So I think it's something to tread very lightly on. And um, ultimately, I would advise against attempting to reject someone's unemployment claim. But again, that's a bit of a gray area question because technically, they, their privileges to receive unemployment should be revoked if they decline to come back. Yeah, but given that there's really no trouble to the employer to just hire somebody else, maybe part ways and just wash your hands of that situation, but, you know, choose. Yeah, I think it's a cost-benefit analysis a little bit, and just to think about what do you win if you reject their ability to claim unemployment? You know, they may not, they probably won't come back anyway. So what are you achieving by doing that? Yeah, absolutely. That's a really a great, you know, ethics question that we're all kind of dealing with here. Another great question we have is if um, with the suggestion to potentially consolidate the amount of staff and give them more jobs, understanding that we're not going to be turning tables like we ever were, right? We're not going to have 100 people over and over. The busy, busyness is not going to be like it was for a long time. So if you've got somebody who is a barista and sometimes they're working as a barista and a server, they're working multiple jobs, how do you avoid tip pool issues or if you're just writing a new policy essentially when you reopen? That's a really, really good question and probably requires more than five minutes to answer. Um, <laughs> you know, I think generally if you're changing your operational structure, you should consider changing your tip structure. You should always partner with a legal resource to figure out your tip pool. Um, that's something that we even advise on here and there, but really make sure that we refer clients to an attorney um, because this is such a litigious subject. Yeah, and we have a couple of questions about negotiating with employees as they're coming back um, who, you know, to your, they want to know, like, what are you doing for sanitation? Can you pay me at least what unemployment is paying me? How should an owner approach that? I think just anticipating those questions is probably the best idea. Um, if you can sit down and brainstorm all of the possible questions, you know, of all ends of the spectrum that an employee might ask and prepare answers for each of those, the answer is probably going to vary hugely from company to company. Um, but if you can be proactive and just be ready for that, or if an employee reaches out and you're not ready, make sure you don't reply until you're sure of you know, the best possible response. And you have a lot of people who are happy to help 
from HR to legal to accounting, um, other operators. I think using a community like this one to bounce ideas off of each other is really important because there are strengths in numbers when it comes to situations like this. Um, in terms of specific questions, you know, how are you going to ensure my safety? Uh, what happens if a guest comes in and they seem to be coughing? You know, all of those questions are things that we would help our clients walk through and kind of put a plan together for how to address it. But again, it's a very one size fits one situation. Mm. Fantastic answer. And that is our time for today. Sarah, thank you again so much for being here for all of the information. Thank you to all the attendees for giving us this hour of your day to try and learn and connect a little bit more. Sarah is again, we'll send out all the, pre it'll come out tomorrow, likely the recording of this, as well as info on how to get in touch with Sarah for those 30 minute consultations. So any question we didn't get to it, and there were so many for you. Um, You'll, you'll be able to connect with her directly. One thing I want to flag for the folks on the webinar today is um, there's a lot of questions about sanitation, training, resources for staff. Monday, we are doing a session with Ecolab and the ACF on the updated uh, standards of sanitation for hospitality workers. I'm going to give you all a little spoiler alert. ACF is going to give out a code where people can take their 30-hour post COVID, like their upgraded baller status, food safety and sanitation class for free. So you're gonna to wanna to come to that Monday class or at least watch the recording so you get that free thing. Cause you can give that to all your employees and show them how seriously you're taking their health, safety and sanitation. And Ecolab is gonna have their science and smart people here to talk about you know, what solutions work best on the virus, what practices you have and, and best ways to reopen as well. So hopefully that helps a lot of folks with um, with giving a better benefit for free to your employees who can you know, use this for the safety of your community. Sarah, thank you so, so much for being here and for sharing all of this info with us. We will definitely have Sarah back again soon and connect with her on your own um, to get the rest of y'all's questions answered. We hope that you have a great rest of the week and that we see you tomorrow for Spirited Conversation. We have uh, Victoria James tomorrow, which is gonna be really awesome, talking about wine and her new book. Uh, so we'll see y'all tomorrow and thank you so very, very much. Bye. Thank you.